privacy preserving technologies in finance. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So uh, let's get down to it. The idea of this uh, SOK was actually to show uh, that there's a bunch of tasks that can be facilitated by means of multi-party computation that allows for parties who don't trust each other to actually compute on data uh, while keeping it private. Uh, there's this huge zero knowledge craze this day, so we thought it was high time someone would uh, shed some light into different techniques for privacy preserving computation that can actually solve problems that zero knowledge will never be able to solve because it does not allow for multiple parties to actually interact with their private data. So we're looking into this three main uh, tools here, although if you look into the full paper, there's more discussion there. But basically, we start from the idea that everyone already knows, uh, most probably in this room, uh, zero knowledge that allows a prover who has a secret witness to prove a statement about this witness in public while revealing only the fact that the witness satisfies the statement, but not the witness itself. Um, then we have a fully homomorphic encryption that allows for a party who has access to the secret key corresponding to a given public key that was used to generate a bunch of ciphertexts to obtain the result of a computation done on the encrypted data. However, in its uh, original form, meaning one uh, public key and one secret key in, and a secret key in the hands of one party, you basically have, again, the issue that the holder of the secret key learns everything about this computation, all the inputs, and so on. Of course, you can use uh, notions such as threshold FHE and multi-key FHE to then implement what is called as MPC, which is also um, implementable from a number of techniques, such as garbled circuits and secret sharing schemes. In the setting of MPC, you no longer have one party who learns all the inputs and learns all the state of the computation. Instead, you have multiple parties who each come with their own private, private uh, inputs and then perform some arbitrary computation on these inputs while revealing only the output of this computation and nothing else. So with this tool, we can actually go from a setting where we have either one party or a trusted prover who learns all of this information to create a, a, a proof for dual computation to a setting where we can have multiple parties, possibly in a decentralized system, computing on their private inputs. And past this introduction now, uh, let's dig into the actual applications of these uh, techniques to finance. The paper actually covers more applications than what I'm going to cover here today but I'll be focusing on the applications that are clo more closely related to finance itself than the other applications that we, um, th that we covered. So I'm skipping identity and KYC because everybody's probably uh, familiar with the idea of anonymous credentials and so on and single sign-on, and I want to talk in more details about the AML uh, applications. So we have a challenge here in the setting of AML of um, determining the risk that some account or some user is performing money laundering, right? We want to detect uh, money laundering and uh, then be able to audit these accounts manually to either punish someone who is performing money laundering or um, automatically uh, dismiss the case. The, this, this is required by law in, I guess, every country probably, uh, and by international regulations. So it is a problem that usually institutions, financial institutions, have to perform this uh, sort of task on incomplete data. They have data about their own customers, they have data about the income and outgoing transactions of their own customers, but they do not have access to uh, data about the people their customers are transacting with. Uh, in the setting, you can use MPC, obviously, to allow multiple financial institutions to solve this problem. And uh, in the decentralized setting, we can also uh, use different sets of tools, also MPC, to actually try to establish other kinds of rules, such as uh, a, a private uh, spending limit over which transactions become revealed or de-anonymized and so on. In the first uh, compliance analysis for uh, AML case, we hear consider the, the fact that we have multiple accounts in multiple different in the financial institutions, each of them with an associated risk score or uh, any sort of parameters that might uh, determine the risk of an account being involved in money laundering. And here we want the financial institutions to collaborate with each other in order to cross-check, cross-examine their uh, different accounts to detect 
potential money laundering. This has been uh, proposed in a number of uh, works, and uh, I know that there's uh, many more on the way now and being posted in ePrint every day. This uh, can be used by um, real, uh, real world uh, institutions, actually, given the speed of current protocols, if you don't have too many institutions. Then we have the idea of a centrally, ba centrally banked distributed cryptocurrencies, where you also want to establish some sort of rule about uh, how users can perform uh, transactions and um, do those transactions anonymously and privately until they might be overstepping some boundary. Usually this boundary is considered um, a limit, a spending limit, after uh, that limit is reached, then an auditor should be able to analyze these accounts and transactions manually to determine whether there is evidence of uh, money laundering. This um, has been proposed in papers are currently in submission. Uh, and uh, there are tools that are, ba that are based on secret computation that can help you do this sort of application. Then let's go to the... Um, Legal aspects of uh, privacy enhancing technologies, there has been a lot of uh, work on actually using privacy enhancing technologies for law and um, law enforcement and investigations and court cases and so on. Uh, a bunch of papers by um, Sanu Park and Shafi Golvasa and Kankanetti have covered this in recent years, but you can read more about that in the full paper. I'm going to jump in directly the applications of PETs to business uh, cases. Uh, one uh, big business case is that of uh, credit score computation and benchmarking of financial performance. Uh, this is uh, needed by banking institutions who are giving loans to other people and, or other institutions, and it is done as a matter of due diligence. Just the due diligence part of proving that you don't have anything bad going on, you could potentially do with uh, zero knowledge. However, when you're actually computing credit scores, you need to analyze private financial data from a customer under parameters that need to be kept secret and that are determined by the bank. Otherwise, it would be easy to fool the bank when going through this process. This has been actually run in Denmark uh, between uh, certain financial institutions and the uh, beetroot farmers, the same beetroot farmers uh, that participated in the first uh, live use of uh, MPC in the real world for the famous Danish beetroot auctions that I'll also cover later. And so this is a, a very interesting uh, application where you can actually retain privacy of your own data and have data sovereignty while still allowing for proper due diligence and the sort of credit score computations. Digital asset custody, that's about something that I think everyone here must have heard of in one way or another, basically keeping digital assets, tokens, cryptocurrency, uh, control in the hands of not one server that may be hacked, and then have their keys stolen so that people can steal the tokens, but actually distribute these secret keys by means of a threshold signature schemes to a committee of parties who then control these funds. Uh, there's a lot of that on the full paper, but since I believe most people are already familiar with this, I'm going to skip to the more, more interesting part and the, most of the content in the paper, which is about the use of um, privacy-preserving computation techniques in markets and settlements. So first, let's start with the uh, traditional um, markets. One of the most, uh, done, uh, the most popular uh, operations that have been done for centuries is that of uh, auctions. As I already mentioned before, this was the first uh, real-world use case of uh, multi-party computation. It was deployed between uh, the Danish beetroot farmers, their association, their um, like Guile and the company that buys beetroots for them in order to determine first who, which farmer gets what production quota that the company promises to buy and what the price of these production quotas will be when they're being negotiated and also the final price of the actual beetroot town or shares. Um, this, of course, does not apply only to beetroot auctions. We can do uh, all kinds of uh, sealed, sealed bid auctions, first price, second price, there's a vast literature on how to implement it, and it can actually be implemented quite fast by means of specialized protocols. Now, to more interesting parts here, the, this application I particularly like, there's the issue of trading large amounts of stocks and high volume trading. Um, in, in this case, 
this traditionally done by means of dark pools, where essentially a financial institution takes orders from individuals and other institutions who are interested in negotiating high amounts of uh, stocks and uh, tries to match and fulfill these orders privately because doing that in the open market could cause price fluctuations that are um, not uh, wished by anyone involved in the process. This uh, has been done by, like that for decades. And very recently, JP Morgan has actually deployed a system called PriMatch that uses multi-party computation to, do, uh, to implement a dark pool among their customers. So as far as I know, it's the first one running in the, in the market, and it is handling a fair amount of orders. It's still not used for every single order they do. Of course, it's just for their dark pool service. But um, with the advances we've been having in the recent years, hopefully it will be possible to actually run this on, um, on trading in the open market as well. But at least for the dark pool case, it's a very interesting solution uh, in eliminating the full trust on the bank. Of course, there's still uh, the, the trust issues when introducing the solutions. Uh, I had a fun talk with the JP Morgan people last week, and they said it was a that there were some clients that needed convincing that this was actually secure. So apparently people in the business side still need to learn about these techniques. Um, now to decentralized markets and DeFi, we can also run uh, auctions in this sort of market so based on DeFi without actually knowing the parties involved in the auction beforehand. And there's a number of solutions to that. I'm not aware if something has been deployed, but I know that uh, the numbers on the papers are very reasonable. You could actually run this on a, on a blockchain system using a smart contract to uh, orchestrate the whole auction. Then uh, we have the issue of AMMs and decentralized exchanges. There have been a bunch of talks about that yesterday already on uh, the issue of uh, minor extractable value and how that affects um, the um, prices and how much value is being extracted uh, from DEXs and AMMs. And using uh, MPC techniques, you can actually create a sort of decentralized dark pool that works as a privacy preserving decentralized exchange and or AMM. Since these techniques allow for computing any arbitrary function, you can implement very complex markets and very complex um, liquidity pools and so on. There have been a number of papers on this, uh, on this topic. I'm not sure if there's something deployed already, but um, I think we're getting there at least for high volume trading that would also make sense, it seems. And then let's move to Interbank netting, which is another traditional finance uh, application that uh, becomes um, possible in this context with uh, multi-party computation. Usually when uh, banks do transactions and provide loans and so on, they, they have other banks that actually provide loans to them and so on, and then they have to balance their accounts. This can be done um, in, in the clear, of course, but there are issues in actually doing this in the clear because uh, knowing this, um, this information in plain text could give you some knowledge that you should not be getting. However, here we could actually run an MPC computation among the banks in order to do this netting and balance their accounts. This has been proposed in a, in, in a number of papers. I don't know if the banks are doing this, but... In a different note, I know that the JP Morgan people are also doing, um, they're running a uh, permission blockchain among a bunch of banks in there, and they're associated with them all over the world to do this netting among them. It's, a, it's different because here we're talking about a permission system and uh, banks who already have trust relations. But the idea, the general, more general idea is more powerful than that, is actually having institutions that do not trust each other doing netting and so on by means of uh, MPC. And finally, there's the application to demand uh, response markets. Those uh, markets are um, pervasive these days with the rise of uh, renewable energy and the way that this energy is traded. I actually don't know how it works in the US, but uh, in Denmark, we we actually get fluctuating prices and according to, for example, wind in the, in the environment because a lot of the energy generation is done by windmills. So you can actually trade these uh, goods, you can trade energy, for example, and that's a demand response market that can be um, 
made, you can make this possible with privacy without trust by using MPC as well. The same kinds of, uh, of tools that we've been using for um, auction and so on could be repurposed. And there's also specific purpose protocols that have been proposed for this case. So to summarize, uh, we've seen a number of uh, applications that are enabled by privacy enhancing technologies that allow for computing on data that is privately held by different parties. Computing a joint function of all of this data without revealing anything else but the output. This enables uh, applications in AML, in, um, in markets trading, in um, legal, in making it easier to realize legal requirements such as credit scoring and so on, and also in keeping your assets secure. That one, uh, I forgot to mention that that is deployed. I think everyone have, has heard of at least one of the companies that were sold recently. So both Unbound and CPR were sold for some hundreds of millions of dollars to players in the cryptocurrency market that wanted their solutions for threshold signatures. Fireblocks is on the rise now, it's basically the uh, only competitor in the field. So this is actually running on the real world right now. And uh, I hope this uh, inspires you to look a little bit more into different uh, privacy enhancing technologies than just DK and, real and realize the potential that this has to uh, enable new applications in finance. Thanks, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Any questions for Bernardo? Well, uh, I'm a paranoid cryptography guy, so we don't trust that because that has been broken again and again and again and again, right? Every, every year there's uh, tens of papers breaking SGX and breaking other enclaves, so we didn't consider that. We consider only schemes where you don't have to trust the harbor. Oh, they would, but that's equivalent to having a trusted third party. If you're willing to trust this hardware, you can do it, sure. Uh, but you're trusting the hardware. So that, that our point is uh, surveying uh, techniques that don't require the trust. So in, in that case, is it true that every single other paper that was part that was in scope for your survey has the following property, that there is no trust whatsoever in any of the hardware? You don't have to trust your... Including the client. Yeah, you don't have to trust the hardware. We're using a, we're when you compute a signature, you always compute it with a second different hardware device. No, you don't. You don't need to. You don't need to do that, right? I mean, or you were saying you're talking about um, backdoor hardware. Okay. Uh, that's a bigger problem. That's, but that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, uh, we're not trusting the hardware to keep the the data secure. If you have if you have a backdoor hardware, that's a different problem. But uh, if you're actually giving your data in the clear to a trusted enclave, and that trusted enclave gets broken, you're you're, expo you're exposing that without actually uh, learning that the attack has even happened. So we don't we don't want to consider those uh, those solutions. There's plenty of uh, papers on that. We'll have time for one more question. Uh, I have a small one. Um, so given your last table, w would you say that um, more effort should be focused on NPC from the research and engineering sides to kind of advance the whole field or? I think there's a, a lot of uh, room for improvement in both uh, coming up with faster protocols, specific purpose protocols, and also looking into different um, problems that could be solved using these uh, techniques. I think if uh, business people had more awareness of these things, they would probably find uses that us uh, cryptographers cannot really propose or see because we don't understand their problems. <laughs> thank you. Let's thank Bernardo again. Uh, yeah, my name is